Hello, everybody. Vinny D here, coming to you live once again from the Fortress of Fragitude. I'm just testing out this deep voice since I seem to have a cold once again. And as long as I sound like the Teddy Graham's bear, I might as well record another rant. Today, I wanted to play with a little what-if scenario. What if Atari survived? How could they have done it, and how would the world be today? Let's theorize. While Atari dominated the console market throughout the late 70s, it was the early 80s when troubles began to show. The loss of consumer confidence began because of large amounts of shovelware titles, with very little quality control, some even shipped completely unplayable. And this ultimately led what we know of as the video game crash of 1983. But could the crash be averted? Yes, I believe it was possible. In this alternate reality, where Atari succeeds and continues to dominate the home console and video game market, Atari sees the shovelware problem arising and enacts greater quality control over their products and what they allow to be released by third-party companies, much as Nintendo would do in the mid-80s after the release of the NES. With the 2600 aging, Atari does not develop the 5200, a massive flop in our reality, so best not to even bother with it. Instead, as they see competition beginning to arise, from Nintendo's NES in the East and Sega's Master System in both Japan and Europe. They put together a truly next-gen system. In other words, the Atari 7800. The Atari 7800 in our time released to huge success initially during a test launch in California. However, the company would change hands to former founder of Commodore, Jack Trammell. And little did Trammell know that Atari did not bother paying the developers of the 7800 before selling off the company to Trammell, leaving the 7800 unable to make a proper global launch for two years while the NES and the Master System made headway. In the successful Atari timeline, Trammell looks a little more closely at the books before making the buy, goes to the table and demands developers be paid before having the company handed off to him. He's a smart man. He's not going to buy a company already swimming in debts. The 7800 makes a release, beating the nest to market by a year in the U.S. With the reputation and name of Atari behind them, the 7800 competes neck and neck with the NES and completely crushes the master system in every market. In our time, Jack Trammell, on his very first day as the new owner of Atari Corporation, fired most of the original talent. This would be damaging to the company. Keeping on board a larger and stronger pool of talent, Trammell makes headway in the console market. In this timeline, the Atari ST is still released, but without so much legal trouble from Jack Trammell's former company, Commodore. This means that Atari's foray into home computers continues. The Atari ST launches on time, bringing us the first multimedia PC years ahead of its time. At the same time, Commodore releases the Amiga, as the two companies don't bother battling it out with one another in the legal realm, they instead compete on the sales floor. This is ultimately good for both companies. So far, Atari's doing well. They're beginning to revolutionize home computing while staying strong in the console market. But the 32-bit wars are ahead. In our timeline, Atari poured a great amount of effort into developing a console they never released, the Panther, intended to compete with Nintendo's Super Nintendo, and 
the Sega Genesis. However, by the time they'd completed work on the hardware, their test kits just didn't work. And so this project, which had already had a large amount of money poured into it, was just abandoned. Instead, having more money available, having been much more successful in the 8-bit era, and also gained a strong foothold in the home computer market, they used this improved financial stability to fix the Panther and get it to market. Will it succeed in competing with the Super Nintendo and Genesis? No. It unlikely could not dethrone these two giants by now. However, the Panther could avoid a large money loss by returning on the investment Atari had already put into it. Meanwhile, Atari is also pouring work into their true next-gen console. The machine to compete with the upcoming N64 and the Sony PlayStation, the Atari Jaguar. The amazing thing about the Jaguar is just how good it could have been with only a small amount of work put into it. With a separate 32-bit GPU and 64-bit CPU, the Atari Jaguar was difficult to develop for, but could be rewarding for those who could use it. However, there was one critical design flaw. The controller chip used to control these two chips, nicknamed Tom and Jerry by the creators, were controlled by a 16-bit CPU, intended to merely be a chip controller. However, it just happens to also be the exact same CPU used to power the Sega Genesis. Lazy programmers, rather than learn to master the Tom and Jerry CPU and GPU combination, instead write lazy Genesis ports directly to the chip controller. In this alternate timeline, this chip is locked down. And this may be hard on developers, but ultimately it will force them to do the harder work of taking full advantage of the system's power. The machine is also tweaked with additional cache and RAM. This helps fix the slowdown and flicker problems that plague many games. And lastly, and most importantly to its success, the Atari Jaguar forgoes the cartridge format and releases, at its original date, in 1992, powered exclusively by the CD format. Had the CD add-on been the original default media format for the Jaguar, we could have seen much greater success. So how is this accomplished? By not splitting the Jaguar's development between CD, VR, yes, Atari did co intend to make a virtual reality addition to the Atari Jaguar. It never panned out. So instead, Atari never even begins to develop the VR headset and instead pours that extra effort into getting the CD ready at launch, built directly into the machine. Now Atari has on its hands a next-gen system capable of truly competing not only crushing the 16-bit competition, but holding out against the PlayStation and N64 throughout the late 90s. A successful Jaguar might not have kept Atari on top, but it would have kept them from folding. And indeed, if you look at the specs today, the Jaguar was so very nearly a good system, if only for a few small tweaks. It could have been a true contender in the console wars. And here ends the history of Atari in our age. But in this alternate future, where could Atari go? Even if successful, the Atari ST line couldn't have changed the history of computing so significantly that it would dethrone the IBM compatibles with the coming of Windows 95 or later the rise of the Macs. But in our alternate timeline, Atari has developed a history of seeing the future coming and releasing early. When they smell the Dreamcast on the horizon, they aim to compete. 
Work begins on the next generation of Atari. CDs have been good to the Jaguar, but now DVD is on the horizon. Atari borrows from its history of home computing, using ideas from the Atari ST. The internet is just beginning to grow, and in the year 2000, we see the release of the Atari Lion. A machine running on DVD format, taking advantage of the larger storage capacity, and also functioning as a DVD player, it proves itself as the very first console to be capable of connecting directly to the internet. And once again, with the name and reputation of Atari behind them, the Lion has enough of a head start to have a strong install base. And while the PS2 and the Nintendo GameCube, and even later the Microsoft Xbox, come onto the scene, there's already a strong, large, and loyal Atari fan base. And while Nintendo loyalists cling to the GameCube, and fans of the Sony PlayStation are eager to try out the PlayStation 2, there is simply no room in the market for Microsoft with the large install base of the Atari Lion. This fierce three-way console battle between the Lion, GameCube, and PS2 sees developers pushing the Atari to its limits. And while the other two systems prove to be a little more powerful, the versatility of the Lion allows it to hang in the console market all the way through to the end of the generation. Here, we're starting to get into very recent history. Sony never saw it coming. Microsoft didn't see it coming. And certainly Atari couldn't have seen it coming. The less powerful but incredibly innovative Wii bursts onto the scene and redefines gaming for a generation. Yet Atari remains a powerful brand name. And with the overpriced and hard to develop for PS3 floundering at launch, Atari still has an opportunity to stay in the race. And Microsoft, having never entered the console market, leaves much more room open. After all, the success of the Lion had already proven to Atari that what their fans wanted was both the specialized hardware and software that allowed consoles to sing, combined with the versatility of a PC. Atari decides to double down on internet connectivity without the Xbox and Xbox Live. Atari is the pioneer of online connectivity online multiplayer, and a unified online service, as well as the full digital distribution of games. And having repurchased their arcade division, Atari is especially well positioned to digitally distribute its arcade classics. And while this won't stop the Wii from dominating the market, it maintains the strength of the Atari name, Atari loyalists stick to their systems. So, by the end of the last generation, the Atari Puma succeeds in keeping Atari relevant. And that brings us to today. Perhaps the next-gen system could be called the Atari Tiger. And here we are. Present day. Present time. And the three-way war rages between the Nintendo Switch with its innovation, the PS4 with its raw power, and the Atari Tiger with its versatility. In this timeline, Atari has spent more on development and seen a bigger return, while avoiding certain missteps. Some might even say the obstacles Atari managed to avoid that they couldn't have possibly seen coming? Awfully strange, isn't it? as if they somehow had knowledge of the future. But now, that's just silly, isn't it? But until next time, this is Vinny D signing out. Be good.